Good morning, everybody. Good to see y'all today. I've been looking forward to this meeting for some time, and I'm glad that it's finally arrived. I'm glad to be here with you fine folks at Waverly, and I hope to see you again tonight. Appreciate the meal that's been prepared for us. That's always one of my favorite things about a gospel meeting, not only getting to preach, but getting to eat, and so we're excited about that as well. We want to focus this week about how great Jesus is. You know, sometimes I'm afraid we think too little of Jesus. We don't think about Jesus enough, number one, because we're so busy. We've got all these things going on. We've got life that's coming at us. We've got to work our jobs 40, 50, 60, 80 hours a week. But we also try to think about Jesus just a little bit. And I'm afraid that sometimes Jesus gets the leftovers, as it were, as far as our time is concerned. So I want us this week to focus on Jesus during our worship. But I also want to challenge you through the week, through the day, before we come to church at night, to be thinking about Jesus, to be thinking about who He is. Now I also, number two, am afraid that we think too little of Jesus, Because we don't realize who Jesus is. And that really is going to be the focal point of our series of gospel meetings this week. Who is this Jesus? You know, we want to focus on that because life comes at you hard and fast. And if we're going to get through this life, if we're going to make it day by day, if we are really going to enjoy the abundant life that Jesus promised, we need to know that Jesus is great enough to make that life possible. You know, just yesterday, we had gotten up in the morning and we were getting ready to have a birthday party for our Evie. Evie's five, she's going to be six next week. But we were going to have her birthday party yesterday. Timmy's birthday party is going to be Saturday. But we woke up early that morning and Evie was not feeling too well. She was sick and vomiting. You know, that's always a good way to start a birthday party. But we went on through the day and we noticed that there was something wasn't right. Evie and her sister Sophie both have type 1 diabetes, and so that's a struggle that many of you are aware, and many of you probably have to endure. But we just couldn't get things worked out. Her sugar was high, and she wasn't getting any better, getting more and more lethargic as the day went on. Until finally last night, my wife says, we've got to take her to the emergency room. We've got to go to Williamson Medical Center. And so they load it up in the van and they go to Williamson Medical and they did what they could for her there, but they said, we've got to take her to Vanderbilt. And so they put them all in the ambulance because apparently you can't drive to uh, Vanderbilt from Williamson Medical. You've got to take an ambulance. And so they got in the ambulance and they drove to Vanderbilt and they said she's in DKA. It's a diabetic problem and she's been Uh, taken care of. She's doing a lot better now. And my wife just sent me a picture of our little Evie and she's got a big smile and looking cross-eyed. So she's all better, all right? But how do we get through things like that? How do we go through life when things unexpected like that all of a sudden can throw our world upside down? You've got to know who Jesus is. And when we know who Jesus is, then we can trust Him. Then we can have confidence in Him. Then we can trust that He is going to take care of us. He is going to take care of His people in this life, but most importantly in the life to come. And in order to see that this morning, I want us to turn to the Gospel of John chapter 1, where we read those beautiful words, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, And the Word was God. Those are words that we have memorized, aren't they? They're words right up there in beauty and power and glory with Psalm 23. That's one of the first verses you've probably ever memorized and retained even to this day. And I want us this morning to focus on who Jesus is. 
Because whenever we think too little of Jesus, either not enough time or we don't think about Him as being great enough, then our lives will be miserably altered and we will be led away into the world and we may be drawn away from the Lord, we may be drawn away from the church because we've forgot, forgotten just how great Jesus is. It will help us through our temptations to know how wonderful Jesus is. It will help us through our trials in life because we know who Jesus is. And so let's start dissecting this morning John chapter 1 and verse 1 where the Bible starts and says, In the beginning. Now let's first think about that word in. In the beginning. At the beginning. Before the beginning was, there was Jesus. Now John 1.1 starts off a whole lot like Genesis 1.1, doesn't it? You go back to Genesis 1.1 and there you read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It sounds a whole lot like John 1.1, doesn't it? And John is making that parallel because he is talking about that eternal existence that Genesis 1-1 is talking about. Because Genesis 1-1 and John 1-1 really start before time and space began. And so you can look around at everything that is. And tonight you can go up and look at the moon and stars and you can see all of those planets in outer space. You can go outside right now and try to look at the sun. It won't last very long. You know, it's going to hurt your eyes. But you can do that. You can go outside and look at all of the trees, and you can look down at the earth, which seems like it's been here forever. But there was a time when all of that was not. There was a time when nothing was. There was a time when there was nothing physical in existence. The only existing things were God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit said, Let there be light. God the Son made it to be. God the Spirit finished the work. That's what we see in Genesis 1. But in John 1, 1, we're going back to that eternity. Before there was ever anything physical, before there was ever anything that was made, there was in the beginning, before time and space began, before the universe was spoken into existence, was the Word. Now that word was is very important. You'll see it three times in our verse for this morning. I want you to circle that word was. You've probably never paid much attention to the word was before, but it's one of the most important words in all of this whole Gospel of John. You see that word was is in a special Greek tense called the imperfect. The imperfect. Now the imperfect Greek tense means that it's something that's an ongoing action. Kind of like my preaching right now. Some of you are going to think it's eternal. Don't make any crazy jokes when I'm finished, right? You're going to think that it's going on forever and ever. But right now it is presently going on. You see, it is an uncompleted action. Incompleted action. That is what that Greek word means. An incompleted action. Something that was going on at that present time. Now that is contrasted with something that happens and it's over. Just like I hit the pulpit. You see, that is a pompilier action. It happened in space and time, and now it's over. It stopped. I hit the pulpit, and now it's done. Kind of like we might used to say, you know, 10, 20 years ago, Tennessee football was great. But that has stopped, right? We hope that will come again. But right now, that has stopped. We hope for a revival, right? But we look back to our word here in John 1, 1, the word was. And it is not... A stopped. It is not something that happened and it never happened again. It is an ongoing action. In the beginning, the Word was being. He was existing. 
He was, is, would be. There was never a time that He was not. He is not created. You know, there are some of our religious friends today that believe Jesus is a created being. But the Bible says here in John chapter 1, in verse 3, that all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that hath been made. Jesus created everything, and nothing that has been created has been created without Him. That tells me that Jesus is not created. But furthermore, we can already see that in our little word, was. You see, Jesus is not a lower deity. But if you'll read in the Watchtower translation, the Bible says that, or their translation said that he was a small g God. The word was a little g God. You see, not as good as the Father. He's, he's pretty awesome. He, he's, he's a little g God, kind of like we might say, you know, Thor or Zeus, you know. They're, they're kind of divine beings. But he wasn't like the Father. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that Jesus is not created. In fact, Jesus created everything that is. And we see that already in this Greek verb, was. Because it, the word eternally, was being. He is not created. Instead, he is perfectly equal with the Father and the Spirit. So we have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit who are co-equal, co-eternal. They are all perfectly divine. They share in the same essence, but they are three distinct persons. But today we're focusing on the second member of that trinity, Jesus. In the beginning was continually being. In the beginning was continually being the Word. Now, that's an important word, too, isn't it? The Word. We go back to the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, and we see, by your word were the world's frame. Well, we, we can go back to the ancient Greco-Roman thought, and we see that this, they use this word, word, the word logos, from which we get logos and such, but the word logos, the word, is a word that they use to describe the reason behind everything. The reason that everything else exists. The reason that everything is. The logos. From which we get our word logic. Logical. So we see that Jesus is the logic behind everything. Jesus is the creative force behind everything. Jesus is everything to me. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was being, before time and space began, was being the one who is the reason for everything that is. That's Jesus. Isn't that incredible? Because sometimes we're so self-centered we can only think about ourselves. We can only think about my wants, my desires, how I want to live, how I want my football team to be great, what I want for lunch. But the Bible says that in eternity, Jesus, the Word, is the reason for everything. And it has eternally been that way. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word, the reason for everything, Jesus, was with God. The Word was with God. You see, the Word was not a lower deity. Instead, He is equal to the Father. Now this word, with, in Greek is the preposition pros. And it's really an interesting phrase because the word pros in Greek literally means up against. And so you watch football yesterday, you're going to watch football this afternoon, and you see the offensive line and the defensive line, as soon as that ball is hiked, they are against one another. They are to one another. And if one of those men are stronger than the other, you know what's going to happen, right? They're going to push the little guy out of the way, and then they're going to sack the quarterback. 
I played two games of collegiate football. Well, it was a club football at Freed Hardman. And I only got to play two games and like two snaps of each game. And I was there uh, trying to be something of a tight end. But I am, you know, me. And everybody else was a whole lot bigger than me. And so as soon as the ball was hot, guess what happened to me? Out of the way, right? Out of the way. But the Bible says that the word was pros, the thought. They were together. They were equal. Notice that our word was is still there. They were eternally together. They were eternally in one another's presence. Jesus, then the Father and the Spirit, eternally together. But that word pros is also the preposition from which we get the Greek word for face, prosopon. And so to say that one is pros another means that you are face to face with one another. You are face to face with one another. Who is it you're face to face with? Have you ever met somebody that's famous? You ever met somebody that's awesome? One time I got to listen to Peyton Manning make a speech. It was awesome. He did a great job. And my wife and I were walking out of the arena there, walking out of the auditorium, walking up this hill that we thought we knew pretty well. And all of a sudden, the state trooper comes flying by. And my wife's pulling me out of the way. And I look over, and there's Peyton Manning in that state patrol car. Peyton Manning almost got me. And I bet nationwide would have been on my side at that point. But when you see somebody great like Peyton Manning, you're like, wow. And you just stare at them. And sometimes you just avert your eyes, don't you? You're almost afraid to look at them. Kind of like the protocol for meeting the Queen of England. Have you ever met the Queen of England? I haven't either. But whenever you meet the Queen of England, you're supposed to bow and look away. Why? Because you are of a lower rank. You're... You're, you're not of the same rank, the same class as the Queen of England, and so you're supposed to divert your gaze. The Word was always, is always, face to face with the Father. And that has eternally, in eternity, beyond space and time, that's always been the case. Jesus is equal with the Father. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now here in our final phrase in this verse here, John 1 and verse 1, we have seen the word God twice. But here at the end, we see that the word in Greek is switched a little bit. It's not exactly the same form that we've seen it before. And so something slightly different is being said. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. But now we see there's something different going on in the way this Greek word is used at the end of the verse that sets it apart from the middle part. And what's being done here is that John is saying by inspiration of the Holy Spirit that whatever the Father was, so the Son is. So he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was divine. That's the way I, I think would be more helpfully translated. The Word was divine. That's my Jesus. That's my Savior. The one who created everything. The one for whom everything is created. Is the one who is fully like God. And he died for me. And he died for you. Can you think of anything more magnificent than that? 
Can you think of anything more incredible than that? That Jesus... Now, remember who Jesus is. He was eternally existing. Everything that is, is for Him. He was with the Father. And He is perfectly like the Father in His deity. And He knows my name. He knows your name. He knows your life. And you have been created by Him. And you have been created for Him. There's nothing better than that, is there? What are you going to be thinking about the rest of the day? What are you going to be thinking about the rest of the day? What are you going to spend the rest of your life focused on. I know you've got to go to school tomorrow, right? You've got all your homework done. You've got all your stuff ready for all your tests. I know you've got bills coming in, right? I've got some new bills to be coming in here soon. You ready for all that? Are you planning for it? That can be a heartache, can it? It can be a, a headache. It, it can make you sick to your stomach. All the responsibilities of life. What, what, what about all the joys of life? You've got your kids that you love. You've got all those pictures set up on the mantel. You've got all those pictures dotting the hall of your kids, your grandkids, great-grandkids. All the good things you've got going on in life. Enjoying retirement, enjoying family. Maybe you're in the prime of life and you are just, just really thrilled at everything you've got going on. What are you going to be thinking about? Remember why all that is there? If you'll look with me to the book of Colossians. The Bible tells us why, why we have all these things. Why everything that is exists. Colossians 1 and verse 15. Speaking of Jesus, the Bible says that He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn, the first class of all creation. For in Him were all things created in heavens and upon the earth, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things have been created through Him and unto Him. Why is it that everything that is has been made? Why is it we can look out at the beautiful scenery, the beautiful weather, we can visit the Grand Canyon and see the beauty of God's creation, of God's handiwork, we can go out and look at the stars and we can say, what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou carest for him? Why is it we have all of this beauty? Why is it we have great families? The Bible says everything that is has been made by Jesus. And it's been made for Jesus. Why is it you get to enjoy your family? For Jesus. Why is it we go through hardship so that Jesus will be glorified? Why is it we go through the mundane, but as Christians we turn the mundane into majestic because whatever it is you do tomorrow for work, you do it for Jesus. It's no longer ordinary, it's holy because it's for the Lord. Why? Because everything that is is made by Him and through Him and for Him. Is your life like that? Is your life that way? That's the way it's supposed to be, isn't it? The Bible says that all things are for Him. And then in verse 17, He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. All things hold together. 
The book of Hebrews tells us that all things are upheld by the word of his power. Now this is part of who Jesus is. The very fact that we're able to sit here this morning on a pew that doesn't fly away or dissolve into nothingness. The very reason your heart keeps beating and the very reason that there's, head, there's hair still left on your head, the very reason that you're able to breathe right now is because according to the scripture, there is Jesus in eternity and he is thinking about us and making us to be. Jesus eternally making us to be right now. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that awesome? Shouldn't that be our life's purpose? If everything is made by Him, if everything is made for Him, and if everything that we presently see right now is being held together by the word of His power, shouldn't He be the focus of our life? So we read in Colossians 1 and verse 18 that He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the, begin, from the dead. Why? So that in all things He might have the preeminence. So that in everything, whether by life, death, joy, sorrow, anything we're going through, so that through Him He might have the preeminence. So that my life has one purpose. The glory of Jesus. That's awesome, isn't it? You don't just get up and go to work tomorrow. You don't just have a regular day. You don't just have a regular heartbeat. You have a moment in time that's been created by Jesus, for Jesus. And it's being held together by Jesus. Every nanosecond. That's amazing. But we keep on looking here in Colossians 1. In verse 19, It was the good pleasure of the Father that in Him should all the fullness dwell, and through Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, having, been, having made peace through the blood of His cross, through Him, I say, whether things upon earth or things in the heavens. Here is one of the chief ways that my Jesus has the preeminence in all things. Because through the blood of His cross, through His suffering on Calvary, He brought reconciliation so that He can present us to the Father. Is your life made, centered, founded, and lived for that reality. Is Jesus your everything? Is Jesus your all? If not, we need to refocus, don't we? Because there is one reason why we exist. Jesus. There is one hope that we have. And that one hope is Jesus. If you're not a Christian this morning, Jesus is your Savior. Jesus came to this earth. He died for your sin. The same one who was with the Father, perfectly equal with the Father, took on flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. But that same physical body suffered, bled, and died for me and for you so that you could be brought home to glory. He didn't want heaven without us. So we sent heaven down. And now he is in heaven waiting. Waiting for you to make that grand confession that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, 
and that you have repented of your sins. You've decided you're not going to live in sin any longer, but instead you're going to be a Christian. And because of that, you are baptized, immersed in water. And the Bible says at that moment in time, all of your sins are forgiven, and you are made a new creature in Christ Jesus. You are created again to be especially for His glory, as a people for His own possession. Who could refuse that this morning? Who could refuse such an offer? But to be able to walk with God in a special way, to be able to live your life with and through and for Jesus in a special way. If you're not a Christian, the time is now. Why don't you come? Why don't you put on Christ in baptism? Why not be saved? Even right now. Won't you come as together we stand and sing?